Hey guys, welcome to uh, this edition of The Narrative. This is CCV President Aaron Bear. Uh, a little, little bit of a different episode for us uh, this week. Um, we're not, we're going to skip over our, our, our typical news uh, segment. Um, we've got a friend on the, on the show this week, uh, Michael Mastretta from uh, the Fellowship of Israel-Related Ministries. Uh, Michael uh, lives over in Jerusalem. He and his family are there. You'll hear a little bit more about him. Um, Wanted to just jump right into the conversation because Michael is uh, sharing a lot of what's going on. A little bit of a, a listener warning. Um, you're going to hear a lot about the war uh, and uh, in Israel right now, and it is uh, indeed a war in every sense. And so uh, a lot of a lot of heavy conversation. Um, it, frankly, it's still kind of sitting uh, with me. A lot of lot of um, of light as well in it, um, and uh, hope in, in in Yeshua in Christ uh, through this conversation. Um, I, I've gotten a number of texts and, and calls since since October seventh, since the, uh, the 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 invasion by Hamas terrorists uh, first happened. Um, about about my thoughts about about what's going on over there. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of something that, that's said regularly, which is when you know there's chaos in the world. Sooner or later, people start blaming the Jews. Um, and I think there's some some truth to that right now with the, the turmoil in, in the world generally. And uh, I really love, I, I really want to encourage you to stick around, especially towards the end of the conversation. Michael says some really beautiful things about um, why God has such a heart for the Jewish people and why we need to as well. Um, and I want to encourage you um, both to be praying for for Israel, praying for the, for the Jewish people, um, praying to understand God's heart more um, in this, um, and and again, I, I we, we can't talk about this war and, and not understand the politics behind it. Um, as we're getting ready to vote here in Ohio to stop the, the murder of thirty thousand kids every year from an abortion amendment, guys, I, I I just can't emphasize enough. This is why the ministry of CCV matters so much, in the sense of calling Christians to think about how we vote. Um, the situation in Israel cannot be. Uh, separated, segregated from the political situation in America right now and the leadership that we have. Um, and if if we did not have a president who had not sent $6 billion to Iran, um, if we did not have leadership that um, didn't understand the the nature of what's, what's truly going on in the Middle East, didn't leave Afghanistan the way they did, didn't get involved in, in so many other situations uh, that, that have put us in a, a Put us in a weaker spot and expose Israel to this. We this war would not have happened. I'm I'm convinced of it. Um, and I, I realize that I'm I'm getting uh, even more political than normal on 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 this on the podcast right now. But it is something that my heart is burdened with, and and just a call to Christians to be wise with how we vote, understanding that um, our vote is indeed caring for our neighbors is indeed caring for those around us because the decisions that our elected officials make the decisions that we vote on on the ballot um allow for people to prosper allow for people to die that there's no other way around it and so um my encouragement through you this is again let's be in prayer but uh let's commit ourselves to being wise stewards of this good gift of voting and and be thinking through how would God have us use our vote to elect folks that are going to uh, stand up for righteousness and oppose wickedness uh, in a meaningful way, uh, in a, an incredibly meaningful way? So, uh, looking forward to this conversation, uh, and I think you'll you, you'll enjoy it and also be be moved by it. And we're back on the narrative. Mike Andrews, Aaron Baird, David Mahan joining you for a good conversation that we're looking forward to having with Michael Mistretta of FIRM, which stands for Fellowship of Israel Related Ministries. And really, we want to have this conversation because we've been pretty focused on Ohio lately in this volume of the narrative. There's a lot going on in our state, but we need to acknowledge there's a lot going on in the world right now. And certainly the conflict in Israel has been at the top of a lot of news cycles. So we're grateful that Michael is joining us today. He was born in Toronto, Canada, and raised in the church, later received a call to Israel where he met Pastor Wayne Hillsden and helped start FIRM. From starting his own company as a teenager to 12 years of ministry experience, he's an entrepreneur and an innovator who's passionate about seeing 
ministries in Israel thrive and people coming to know Yeshua as Messiah. Michael's passion for Israel takes him around the world as he strives to build unique connections between the church and the body of believers in Israel and shares about how God is moving in Israel today. Michael immigrated to Israel in 2014. He lives in Jerusalem with his wife, Vanessa, and their two young sons. Michael, thank you so much for, for being part of our show today and, and for having this, uh, I think, really enlightening and necessary conversation. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's great to be here. And obviously, with everything going on, uh, it's great to be able to share with the rest of the world. And Aaron, I know that you and Michael have probably more of a, <laughs> yeah. a history than than anybody at this. No, it's, well, it's funny because especially because our wives work together at uh, Jewish Voice Ministries International, and it's it's just crazy to hear. You know, I think last time I saw you, Michael, uh, ne- neither of us had kids, and now you got two boys, and we got two girls, and life just moves like crazy. So so fast. Uh, yeah, no, it's it, it's good to good to see you there, man. So, Michael, if you could. Could you tell us a little bit about FIRM, what the ministry is, and, and what you're trying to do in Israel? Yeah, so our heart at FIRM is, you know, we want to see a day where every person in Israel is transformed with the love of Yeshua. Uh, in, in a country of 10 million people, we only have about thirty to 40,000 Jewish believers in Jesus, about 6,000 Christian evangelical Arabs. So if you do the math, that's less than a, a fraction of 1% uh, that believe in Jesus, which may surprise you considering this is the place Jesus was born, it's the place he did his ministry, he called his disciples. The gospel went from Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And yet uh, most of Israel would be uh, statistically defined as an unreached people group. And so we serve a network of 72 uh, gospel centered ministries doing everything from reaching, working with Holocaust survivors, working with women on the street, helping to end sex trafficking or drug addiction, planting local congregations. And really the common thread is, you know, that we're, we're doing it in the name of the Lord and showing the love of Yeshua, trying to impact our society. And we have to strengthen that and resource those ministries. That's, that's my normal day job, uh, which I love doing. And it's because a lot of Christians, you know, they want to get involved in Israel, but they don't know where to start. They don't know who to trust. And sometimes the only way to get involved seems to be a very political way. We, we're trying to give people a safe gospel centered way to get involved in what God's doing here today. That's awesome. Michael, Michael, when you, see scriptures like Romans 1 16 uh, which yeah. says for I'm not ashamed of the gospel for is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek what does that mean to you yeah you know a lot of people take that as you know chronologically God first worked with the Jewish people and then worked with the Gentiles but I think Paul also took it as a, as a style of ministry even when even though he was an apostle called to the Gentiles every city he went to we saw, see he sets up first at the synagogue and he preaches to the Jewish people there. And then he sets up right next to the synagogue and he, he, he preaches to the Gentiles, but he says, I magnify my ministry. So as many of my brothers and sisters would come to faith. So I, I see that there's a prioritization, a love for the Jewish people. And uh, Paul really argues this in Romans 9, 10 and 11. He says, look, everything you've inherited as Gentiles, you've been adopted as sons and daughters are grafted in everything works together for good. But he says, I have this, I have this sorrow in my heart, this pain that won't go away. Because the things that were promised to Israel have been inherited by the church. And, and he says that not to say that Israel has been replaced, but to say where, where the church around the world is supposed to prioritize showing Israel that same mercy that they received. And so uh, I see that as something it's not you have to pray about whether you're called to Israel. I think all of us as Christians, as believers around the world, there's a special role that Israel plays as our older brother in, in our family. Uh, that we all should have a heart to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and to be a part of seeing Israel come to know her Messiah. Yeah. You know, Michael, I actually, just, I got a, just a call yesterday from a friend uh, who has a, a, a good, uh, a good a neighbor, I think it is, that's, that's Jewish and a, a, a practicing Jew, a faithful Jew, um, and is whose, whose heart is broken over uh, what's happening in Israel right now. Has, this, this neighbor of his has family over there, friends and friends in Israel that, um, are just in tough spots. Um, and he's been thinking through how he can share about Yeshua, share about Jesus uh, with his neighbor. What? How do you guys go about that at Firm? How do, what, how do you have that conversation with folks right now? Yeah, it's a challenge because uh, there are a lot of obstacles for a Jewish person to come to faith in Yeshua, even to be open to the idea of Yeshua being the Messiah. And we can get into all those different obstacles and roadblocks, but a lot of it just comes down to relationship. Uh, we find that the idea for most Jews, the idea of a Jewish person that believes in Jesus is, is a very uh, reprehensible thought. It's like you're, you're a traitor. Actually, you're, it's like you're worse than a Nazi. 
because you've killed the soul of a Jewish person. And so how do we unravel that narrative? And, and, um, and a lot of that is just what we're doing right now. It's just, Hey, how can we as the body just love people? And then all of a sudden I'm like, well, I, th- well, I thought I hated the idea of a, of a Jesus following Jew, but now I've actually experienced it. And, 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 and these guys are, they're cool. They're like me. They're, they're nice. They're loving. And so it opens up the door to say, man, maybe, maybe just maybe Jesus could be the Messiah. First of all, putting him back in his con in his Jewish context. Um, you know, like my father-in-law would have thought, you know, Jesus was a Catholic born in the Vatican and the new Testament was yeah. the <laughs> first the Jews. Right. So like, how do we recontextualize Jesus? as Jewish, not, not the Torah breaking pork eating Christian, but the Torah observant Jewish rabbi that taught his Jewish disciples that only ever lived in the land of Israel. That so many of the miracles happened there. He said, I was called to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We recontextualize them. I really believe when people search for him, they'll find them. And it's well, when we see Jewish people, they have a, a Hebrew new Testament. They start to read, they start to search. Uh, they say, wow, I'm reading this book. It's, it's not a Christian book. It says son of David, son of Abraham. This is, this is my book. This is a, a Jewish book. No, I, amen. I, I, that, that was uh, very much the, the conversation we had in the sense of, you know, that first and foremost, what I love what you said is, you know, he's just another person first that, that God made. Right. And so, yeah. so, you know, I think a lot of times there's a lot of uh, pressure when you're going to share uh, about Jesus, share about Christ with a, with a Jewish person. And uh, again, this is just somebody else who has, has fears and concerns and and needs the love and grace and mercy of, of Yeshua, just like any of the rest of us. But then even, I, I love what you said too, at the end is that, you know, actually in many ways, to some degree, there's a leg up here because they have a foundation to, to understand who, who Jesus was and what he was saying. And, and his, sure. you know, it's, it's, we, we see this all the time. Uh, Marie and I will talk about this all the time, especially in evangelical circles um, that, the you know, so many Christians today, especially in America, read the, the New Testament without the Old Testament. They, mm-hmm. they, there's so many things Jesus did of proclaiming his deity, proclaiming his messianic nature uh, that are really understood through a Jewish lens. If you don't understand the Old Testament, you don't understand what he's doing yeah. at Passover. Com- communion makes almost no sense. He's just standing up and taking you know, the, the, the dinner plate and starting making all these, uh, these claims about who he is. If you don't understand that as a Passover Seder, it's, it, it loses its, its, uh, uh, its impact. So yeah, uh, it's like it's like coming into a movie halfway yeah. through. You know, yeah. you come into a movie halfway through, you still figure out the ending. Right. You, know, yeah. you, you get you get the major plot themes, but but you might miss why the movie ends the way it ends or what the motivations of the characters are. You, even if you just miss the first you know 10 minutes, you can you can miss that. And so sometimes we come in and we 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 miss the whole prequel and we don't even understand why Jesus did some of the things he did and why it had to be that way. And so I think it's so helpful that we go back to the beginning and we get the whole story and it makes makes that ending that we already know and love that much more meaningful. Yeah, Michael, just to to wrap up the point you're making about uh, scriptures and what Paul said, you know, he mentions that there's this new vine that's being grafted in, but how much more can the, the original vine be coming back in, uh, Absolutely. in Israel? So in terms of your ministry, what are you seeing as you spend more time in Israel and as you, as you continue to advance your mission and your ministry there? Well, you know, I think what we're experiencing in the last 75 years is nothing short of uh, remarkable. I would even say it's, it's a lot of prophecy that we see come to life. First of all, 75 years ago, uh, Israel, a nation being born in a day, you know, no other people group was exiled from their land for almost 2000 years, comes back against all odds and speaking the same modern version of the same language. I mean, it's it's revolutionary. But yet what what we see is not just a physical restoration, but also a spiritual restoration. And I believe God talks about this in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. He says, there's coming a day where I'm going to bring you back into your own land. When I bring you back to your land, I'm going to pour clean water on you. I'm going to take out your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh, put my spirit within you. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. So there's this, there's this physical restoration. God even says, it's not because you deserve it. It's for the sake of my name, that the nations would know I'm, I'm the Lord. It's not because you earned it. It's, it's so that everyone knows something about me, about my character. And then he says, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you back physical restoration. And then I'm going to put my spirit within you, the spiritual restoration. The very next chapter does the exact same thing. Valley of dry bones, there's a physical restoration of bones coming together. And then there's the wind from the four corners of the earth that breathes on these bones, bringing them back to life. So what's happening in Israel today, you ask? I think we're seeing that physical and spiritual restoration. A nation was born in a day 75 years ago. There were 23 Jewish believers in Jesus 
in Israel at that time. Now, fast forward 75 years, we have 30 to 40,000 Jewish believers in Jesus. There's more openness, more receptivity. Even among the next generation, Gen Z, uh, the, the stigmas and stereotypes of our parents aren't there. They're open. They, they see Messianic Jesus as part of their culture, part of their society. And so I'm, I'm really encouraged about what's happening uh, because there is increasing openness. The number of New Testaments in Hebrew we have being requested online has doubled. So I, I believe the more people search, uh, for him, he will be found by them if we seek for him with all of our hearts. Well, on that note, Michael, you know the the eyes of the world are focused on on Israel right now, the war and everything going on. Yeah. Um, no man comes to the Father lest they be drawn by the Spirit. A lot of prayer going on um, for Israel, um, for the peace of Israel. Do you find that in this in this this wartime um, mentality? Is there, do you find that it's an opportunity to, to more um, easily share the gospel in, in this environment, you know, with, with everything going on, or do they respond a little different? Like, like over here, you know, when crisis hits, it's an awesome opportunity to share Christ uh, and the, the spiritual as well as the physical um, redemption and, and safety that comes with knowing Yeshua. Are, are you finding that over there now? Like, are they more responsive to the gospel in, in this environment? Yeah, I, I would say um, that, that there's a spiritual hunger, right? Whenever there's hopelessness and fear, you know, the antidote is not just a physical antidote or emotional antidote. It's really a spiritual thing to, to instill hope, to instill faith, life, joy. Um, and so you have to be careful not to be opportunistic. At the same time, there is an incredible, oh, people are searching uh, for God. In a, in a lot of ways. Uh, how, how could this happen? What's the meaning behind this? We, we, we were so caught off guard. It was, it was an attack that was so um, shocking to so many. I, I talk, I've talked to people saying, my entire faith in our military has just been wiped away because we, we thought we knew everything. We thought we knew when the foreign minister of Iran went to the bathroom. We thought we had that kind of intelligence. And so the, the, the fact that people could be just you know, a couple kilometers away from Kfar Aza, or a couple kilometers away from Be'eri, these towns on the border of Gaza, and 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 we had no idea. It's just, it's jolting. And you know what it does? It, it removes our own security in our own government and our own military. You know, what does the Bible say, Jeremiah? Cursed is the man who trusts in horses, who okay. trusts in chariots, but blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord. Mm. And I think that's a, a, a shifting and a, and a shaking that we have happening inside of people's uh, hearts right now. And as we get into this this part of the conversation, Michael, could you just give us kind of the the first person perspective of what's going on in Israel right now? We're we're obviously hearing a lot about it, but we've got the typical media slants that we're, we're yeah, yeah, yeah. filtered through. So just as somebody who's there in the middle of it, can you give us an overview of, of what the situation is? Yeah, what we had experienced in the last two weeks is nothing short of the worst terrorist attack Israel has ever experienced, the bloodiest most civilian casualties. It's not like what you ex we've experienced before. And that's the biggest thing I want to communicate to people is it's not just another set of rockets from Hamas. It's not another, oh, another Israel and Hamas uh, uh, scuffle that will go away in a couple of days. Uh, it, it really was nothing short of um, the worst, our worst nightmare of what could happen. So I, I was here on Saturday, October 7th, woke up in my home to the sound of sirens in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, we don't get rockets very often, maybe once every five to seven years. Uh, and instead of running to a bomb shelter, I did the wrong thing. I ran outside with my camera and I, I just started looking up above me and I saw rockets being exploded above my head. And these sirens didn't go away. For the whole morning, almost all day, we had back-to-back -back sirens. Hamas had barraged us with 2,000 rockets, which that, that's a lot to put it in perspective. So, in some of our battles with, with Hamas, 11 days, we maybe get 3,000 rockets. So to have in like an hour or two or three, uh, 2,000 rockets fired, that was, that was a lot. And then we got rumors, oh, maybe some of the terrorists have infiltrated. And we thought that couldn't, that can't happen. Maybe 10, maybe 20, 50 seemed impossible. We find out later, 1,500 Hamas terrorists were killed inside of Israel. That's not even counting the hundreds that made it back in with hostages. So probably we had close to 2,000 Hamas terrorists that were in our country, flooding in through the borders, paragliding over, coming into the sea. And then we started getting rumors that they had taken a hostage. And that was 
that, that's shocking for us because the last time Hamas had an Israeli hostage, it was Gilad Shalit. He was an Israeli soldier uh, back in early t- uh, 2000s. They took him into Gaza. And for years, we ended up negotiating a thousand Palestinian prisoners in exchange for one Israeli soldier. But that, that's the memory we have of hostages. So we thought, no way they can have hostages. That's impossible. And I remember the moment I read on the news that they found a baby crying in his home and the parents were nowhere to be found. And I just thought, oh no, they have hostages. And and little did we know at first it was 10, 20, 50, 100. Now we know 203 confirmed hostages, maybe as as high as 250 on top of 1,300, now 1,400 civilians that were killed in the attack. So the whole nation was gripped with what I would call consider post 9-11 trauma, just to put it into the scale for an American. If we, if we compare per capita, you know, 1300 Israelis dying to the country of 10 million, that would be like in America, 40,000 Americans being killed in less than 72 hours. I mean, it, 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 it shocks the nation. And, um, and so the government's been reeling. We've been responding. Um, 300,000 reservists were immediately called up. We've had a couple hundred thousand more that have been called up. Um, and our entire nation has changed. That, that's not 300,000 reservists. That's 300,000 families now that don't have a father there and, and there's no school. So the moms are home with the kids. So that affects workplaces. That affects incomes. I just read a report, 300,000 displaced people, mostly from the border with Gaza that have now been relocated somewhere else in the country. And now the northern border with Lebanon are starting to evacuate. Uh, We just took in about 500 uh, uh, displaced people and families, including 200 children from the northern border with Lebanon at a hotel here in Jerusalem. We're hosting them. They don't know if they're here for a week, two weeks, a month, three months. They have no idea. They've come with the clothes on their back. And uh, so the, the entire nation's in turmoil and we're all waiting uh, with bated breath for Israel to give the order to, to, to go into Gaza and do a ground operation. So, so Michael, um, you know, I, I get a daily update from, um, from APAC over uh, an APAC friend over text of, of what's going on. And, and, you know, again, like, as you said, that this is an active situation. He's, he's saying rockets are still coming in from, from Gaza oh, yeah. as we're oh, still rockets as we're speaking, you know, what is, just as a as a dad, you know, what, what's your day to day life there like right now? I mean, we, I always would comment to folks about, you know, going to going to Israel that it's, you know, in many ways it feels, you know, on a normal time it feels safer than walking around Columbus, right? It's it's typically yeah, Jerusalem, yeah, yeah. typically a very safe place to be, and and you know, you see folks living lives just like we would here in in Ohio. Um, what, what's the day to day, like, what's the grocery store like? What's what you said schools, you know, a lot of schools are closed. What's all that like for you right now? Yeah, typically when we have rocket attacks, you know, things remain open, but after this, I mean, the morning after Sunday morning, after the images are coming out, um, the nation was in, in, in shock and in trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, everything's closed. Everything's closed. Maybe now some things are starting to open, but you got to think you've lost a good chunk of your workforce. You know, three to six hundred thousand or so uh, um, reservists called up. These are like you know your middle-aged men, mostly some women. Uh, that's your prime workforce, and then their spouse is now home with the kids. So you've lost a whole chunk of your workforce. No restaurants are open. I tried to go out to grab a meal the other night. They looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, well, we haven't had any rockets for a while. Things <laughs> calmed down a little, a little bit in Jerusalem, but then just when they calm down, a rocket attack happens again. We had a staff meeting um, on Monday. And during our staff meeting, we heard sirens. We couldn't tell if there were sirens. I opened the window and an explosion went off right next to my head, right next to our building over the Knesset. A huge rocket explosion. It ended up interrupting the Knesset. So the entire our, our entire Congress basically had to go into uh, shelters and they delayed the session for 40 minutes. You know, so the entire country is adjusting to the reality of living under constant rocket fire. My phone, I have an alert on my phone every time a rocket goes off. And, you know, you'll sit there and all of a sudden 60, 60 attacks. Hamas just fired a barrage of rockets from from Lebanon. They're the Hamas group in Lebanon firing in from the north. So nowhere really feels safe. And then at the same time, you hear the stories of these families that have been displaced. I was just I was just with a couple of them hearing, seeing the, the, the street of their city littered with bodies. Uh, the stories of families with their kids in bomb shelters, just hearing for the first time ever in their Jewish uh, settlement, hearing uh, Allahu Akbar in the streets. And then all of a sudden hearing 
got machine guns going off and, and people plowed down and uh, the police station of Sterot was taken and just, just the trauma, um, the the pain is huge. And then, and then, you know, these people, not only do they know people that have been killed, but they know this, this family I was talking to, their daughter, their 18 year old daughter, her best friend was kidnapped, taken mm -hmm. hostage by Hamas. I was, I said, was she at the rave? No, 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 no. She was in her home, in her bedroom. And her and her two parents and her two siblings were all taken uh, by Hamas into Gaza. So I can't imagine what it's like for the hostages right now to be in Gaza, um, how they're treating them. They're starting to issue some of these photos, but it's it, it's revolting to the whole nation. How could this have happened? You know, Mike, I, I, uh, like I said, folks have been in, in prayer over Israel. I was struck last week when somebody prayed um, you know, obviously they pray for the peace of Israel, for the people of Israel. But then I was I was kind of also struck that there was no prayer for the Palestinians at all. Yeah. Um, it it just it just struck me like, you know, they're on, on both sides of, of this war, um, there are children, right? Yes. Being 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 slaughtered um because of the war. Help us understand that balance, right? Yeah. From, yeah. From from the perspective of somebody who is there, who experienced firsthand what you just mentioned, but yet as a believer, um, help us balance this out. Yeah, yeah. Well, we need we need to love all people, and and this is so important. What the Palestinians in Gaza are facing is is nothing short short of a living hell. Um, the the pain on both sides makes it difficult. So imagine imagine you're one of these Jewish families. You're in these uh, communities around Gaza. I, I went and spoke to uh, a few of them. I said, why do you live near Gaza? I mean, wh why? There's so many other places to live. Why live under the rocket fire? They said, you don't understand. We were born in Gaza. Wow. We were born in Gaza. We left in 2005. And she said, I was one of the most optimistic people. I believe, give them our homes, give them our hospitals, give them our businesses for the sake of peace. She said, we left we built a community right next to Gaza. We said, this is the right thing to do for peace. They have their own land. They'll turn it into this pearl in the Mediterranean. And she said, I used to bring food and money to the Gaza border fence and pass it to my Palestinian friends through the fence. And she said, that fence is the exact same fence that Hamas broke down and came and killed our children. So the pain is personal, right? And, and, and it, wasn't just, it wasn't just a handful of terrorists. The images show this border fence open and people were flooding in, flooding across the border. Not just the people that planned it. They were, they were people that jumped on the opportunity to come in and slaughter Israelis. The, the, the instruction manual came out. and you, you translate it, you'll see. They intentionally planned how to murder children, how to uh, kidnap uh, and take hostages, how to target the population centers. They had, they had, they had more intel in Israel than, than I, I think we have in Gaza at, at some points. Mm. So what do you do with the Palestinians? Well, so many around the world now are seeing these images from Gaza. And, and truly, Gaza is like this uh, 2.4 million people living in this cage. Uh, yes, we want freedom for the Palestinians, but freedom from who? I would say freedom from Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Now, why? Well, everyone always says free Palestine, end the occupation. What they don't realize is Gaza got the end of the occupation in 2005. In 2005, right. the occupation finished. There was a disengagement. Israel removed all the Jews from within Gaza, all the settlements, all the Jewish people, some willingly and optimistically, some kicking and screaming in the hope of peace. And this was supposed to be an experiment. What will it look like to give the Palestinians autonomy in their own land? Now, within a few months, Hamas is elected, they kill all the other parties, and they start taking all the money, all the support, all the aid, putting them into terror tunnels and rockets. Terror tunnels and rockets. So the Palestinian people have been at the mercy of Hamas all this time. And so do we need to pray for the Palestinians in Gaza? Absolutely. I think it's so important that people separate Hamas and Islamic Jihad from the Palestinians. We have to separate the two. We also have to make sure that we are understanding that the Palestinians that are in Gaza um, are currently subject to their, their government. The, the, the Hamas is not just the military, has a military arm, Hamas has a civil arm. So all of their schools, all of their uh, education is just indoctrination, it's hatred. They're living within this uh, system. 
And at this point, I don't, I don't know what the right answer is, but Israel's come to a point where they said, we can't just keep living in the cycle every few years. Rockets, a few Israelis die, we retaliate. The, the most loving thing we can do for Israelis and for Palestinians is to get rid of Hamas. Now, the big question that no one has a good answer for is, who replaces Hamas? What do you do? And I, I think Israel's grappling with that question. I know President Biden asked Israel that question. We don't have a good answer right now. If you create a void of power, a vacuum, who's, what's going to take its place? And so that's that's the difficult thing to grapple with. Um, but unfortunately, the, our, our first chance of ending the occupation and giving Palestinians self-governing autonomy has not gone so well. No, amen, Michael. I think that's really well said. That the, the idea that we have you you hear this often on the the two state solution or the can we trade land for peace? Um, it it always vastly underestimates. It's been tried. It, it it's it's been tried in a very earnest way, and not just land for peace, but uh, but resources and, and like like you said, the the billions of dollars that were given over to help build infrastructure and all that, and, and it was turned around to used for for terror, t- terror tunnels and, and, and rockets. And, um, and in, in the meanwhile too, you, you know, I, I remember when I was out there a few years ago and we, we actually had a meeting with somebody from the Palestinian authority and, and no real answer from them about, uh, about Hamas, because Hamas is the one that is, you know, the Palestinian authority is, is really a, a shell government that is, uh, under the control of Hamas, or at least under the fear of Hamas. Right. And, yeah, um, and, and, uh, no ability to, to self police and the and the other thing too again we're 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 going down a, a rabbit trail here but again is the the entire um, Arab world will oftentimes use Gaza and and the the plight of the Palestinians um, as uh, evidence of of how inhumane Israel which Israel is which again uh, Israel does not have is not there's no Jews in 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 Gaza uh, they they frankly leave off that Gaza has has two borders to it one is Israel the other is Egypt um, yeah. and Egypt isn't taking in these Palestinian refugees Egypt isn't ta- isn't uh, allowing the, the these Palestinians to, to come in that are under the control of of, of Hamas um, and and it's it's but Michael this gets to I think one of the biggest things we're we're seeing right now that we're we're struggling with is is the 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 misinformation and a lot of the lies yeah. we're seeing coming out um, of of the war right now. Again, just I think it was yesterday or two days ago, uh, there was the the story of a a, a rock a you know of a, 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 a first it was reported as a missile that dropped on a a hospital in Gaza, um, and then it from Israel is what they accused and killed five hundred people, and it turned out to be a misfired rocket from Gaza that fell in a parking lot in a hospital. Uh, but the media, New York Times, ran with a, a headline that you know Israel killed 500 people in a hospital right out out of the gate. Um, you know, I, I think a few questions the, the, here, but the, the big one is, where should people be going right now if they want to try to get a good sense of what's happening in uh, Israel, and how is that, um, how is that misinformation impacting people in Israel and impacting the war? It's a challenge because in, in our generation right now, there's such a, a dominant. Uh... Uh, uh, need for being first, I mean, the first to report something. And in Gaza, we have a limited access of information. It's not that there's a lot of foreign uh, journalists or press in there. And so we're really subject to what they tell us. And there definitely is a media bias uh, against Israel. Just uh, the same reason, you know, that hospital attack immediately after it happened, uh, it was on every news, every news outlet yeah. that you could see. Right. And they're all reporting you know, the, the narrative that Hamas gives. So it's again, what, what, you know, if Al Qaeda came out with a press release, would everyone just publish it without validating a source? Like, is that, <laughs> is, is, is that how we would take it? No, but Hamas, we do, uh, because there's something, there's something about criticizing Israel that, that resonates in the media. Now, what no one has talked about is that Hamas targeted and hit a, a hospital in Israel, uh, in uh, Ashkelon. They targeted and hit a, a hospital. Now, we, uh, there weren't many injuries because it was secured and bomb shelters and all this kind of stuff. But they, they hit a hospital and they targeted it with civilians. But of course, no one no one has an outcry to that. And so even that whole narrative at first was 500 people killed by a rocket by, by is, from Israel. Then it was, oh, well, maybe it was a rocket. And then it was, oh, wait, it fell in the parking lot. Then it was well, maybe not 500 people. Maybe it was 300 people that were killed. Maybe it was 200. And now 
surely some people died, but maybe it was a hundred. We, we don't know. It, you, you see the pictures and you see the hospital still standing, the hospital still functional. And even the image that was run by a couple of these media outlets was a, a, a totally separate image. So it just shows how we don't really validate facts anymore. We share clickbaity information and especially Instagram stories and Facebook stories and things on social media that are going to get people's attention. And so where do you go to find the right media? I, I, I don't really know. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a lot of great places to go. I mean, I, I read a number of different Israeli news outlets, but honestly, I feel like a lot of the best journalism is being done by individuals online. Uh, it's just some people you can follow on Facebook or Instagram that can actually piece together the narrative from differing news reports and actually give a, a, a solid view. I saw one one such individual that had kind of pulled together all the evidence from the Israeli side, from the Palestinian side, and were able to kind of come to a conclusion looking at all that. But it really is a challenge because years ago, you could trust the mainstream media to validate their sources. And today, you, you really can't. There's a race to be first. Michael, I want to ask this question, and I don't mean it to sound callous in any way, but I feel like as it's in my head, it probably is going to come out that way. But uh, to, to the point, the question is, why should Christians care about this? And and again, I don't mean to be that we should be heartless or removed, but uh, I guess I'm just asking you to to give us that reason that, that Christians should be active and supportive of Israel in this in this time. Yeah, so I think there's a few reasons. Um, one would be that Obviously, what happens in Israel really affects what's happening in the rest of the world. Israel in the Middle East is, if we look even just politically, like a, a, a form of Westernism in the midst of uh, the Middle East, in the midst of this culture, in the midst of a lot of dictatorship, uh, as a de- democratic voice, a democratic force. So I think that just even as, as people from the Western part of the world like we have our attentions on this because it really is israel's kind of at the epicenter as christians i think there's significance because uh god asked us to pray for the peace of jerusalem there's a significance uh to the jewish people to the jewish state uh we should care about anti-semitism that's rising up and what we see even this media narrative is less of um a, a, a politicians debating facts and it's more of a spirit of, of anti-Semitism, a spirit of bias against Israel, a spirit, uh, I really believe it's a spiritual thing. And so we go back all the way to the story of Esther and Mordecai, and we have Haman, hated the Jews, wanted to kill him. No, no explanation, no real uh, reason for it. Uh, I mean, there were reasons, but there, it was just kind of inexplicable. He wanted to kill, wipe out all the Jews. And then we have Hitler, same, same thing, same spirit, different form, different generation, same spirit. And then we have Hamas. It's from Haman to Hitler to Hamas. It's the same spirit, looks at a different form. And so I think it's important for Christians to that, that we're tuned into this because this is not just any geopolitical conflict. This is something that we've read on the pages of our Bible, that we've lived out modern hist- in modern history. We've seen the Holocaust. I was just two months ago, I was in Auschwitz in Poland, and everyone's saying never again, never again. And then we have these atrocities that were committed. You're seeing these children that were beheaded and burned you're seeing this really even one of the the united nations that is borderline genocide that's happened and so it, it's important that we say something and, and and some of the wise men of old would even say you know the most incriminating thing to do is, is when these tragedies happen to say nothing mm-hmm. we look back on the holocaust we think how could people have not said anything when they realized this was happening and I'm not that surprised by that anymore because it happens today. It's easy for us to get callous, cold, feel like it's on the other side of the world. Um, but but God is doing something in Israel. Uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that, the prophetic significance, all of it is. Uh, but d- definitely it's connected to us. And I think as Christians, we have a mandate to pray for, to love on, to support uh, what God's doing in Israel and to have a heart for the Palestinians. And I think there's no way we're going to reach a next generation of Christians unless we don't have a, a very one-sided narrative. No, we need to love the Palestinians, but there is an enemy here, and the enemy is Hamas and Islamic Jihad, and anyone whom that spirit of anti-Semitism resides in, that's what's creating this conflict in this region. My God, I think what's amazing about that, and this is a lot of times when, when I'm getting into conversations with folks about especially ministry of the Jewish people or um or 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 Israel in particular, um, they'll get caught up on, you know, 
uh, on the conversation about about Israel and and about the, the the land in particular, and and um and say, well, what is so special about it? You know, we 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 have people all over the world that need that that um that need Jesus, and and you know, God God created all creation, um and ultimately what i always come back to is is just you you read through scripture i was just reading psalm 69 the other day so it's 69 35 and 36 for god will save zion and build up the cities of judah and people shall dwell there and possess it the offspring of his servants shall inherit it and those who love his name shall dwell in it why does god have a particular heart for israel and the jewish people i don't know but he does i i can't read his word yeah. and tell you what it is about the Jewish people and about the land of Israel and about Zion and about, you know, th 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 this place and this people. Um, but they are God's people that he, he has chosen from the dawn of time and to, to bring good, the good news of salvation to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that should be enough for us um, as Christians to say, we, we care because, because God cares very much. And just like God cares about, you know, I think of our, our good friend, uh, ben Nwankwo, who's who's a Nigerian Christian, and and he cares very much about the Christians in Nigeria right now who are who are being uh, being oppressed and being murdered by 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 Muslim extremists. There, um, it's not to say that he cares that, that he doesn't care about those people, but God specifically talks about this land and this people that He yeah, has a heart yeah. for, and we should too. Absolutely, and you know, I have a toddler, and uh, my toddler sometimes doesn't like it when I choose things. In fact, most of the times, if I don't give him a choice. Uh, you see it and you see, man, this looks like, uh, like what, what the heck happened to my toddler? He looks uh, possessed in some way. I, I don't, you know, and I think this all, it comes down to God's choice, right? When God chooses something, you know, we all, we all like choice when we're the ones doing the choosing or we're the ones who are being chosen. The issue comes when someone else is chosen or someone else is doing the choosing. And really what anti-Semitism is or what even, even a pushback against why should Israel be in this land? It's it's not an attack on Israel. It's it's a lack of faith in God. Thank God, yeah. who are Amen. you to have chosen this people over any other people, and, and over God's sovereign choice? And even God says it's not because you were more obedient, more special, larger than all the other people. It's because I set my love on you, and it's 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 something. It's saying something about God's character. And so I think the enemy knows that. I think the enemy is pushed back against that. If you were you were the enemy, and you knew that uh, you know through the seed of the woman. A, a, a savior was going to come that was going to crush your head. Well, the number one thing I try to do is I try to it, it get rid of that, that, that seed, that seed through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I try to wipe it out, which we see he's done up until Jesus. And now if Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives and he looks over Jerusalem and he says, you're not going to see me again, Drew, Jewish religious leaders, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then if I was the enemy, I would say, well, that's pretty easy. I can keep Jesus from coming back by wiping out the Jewish religious leaders and keeping them from Jerusalem because then they won't be able to welcome him back. So I, 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 I just see the connection between if I was the enemy, my number one strategy would be to wipe out the Jewish people because everything in the salvation story and the salvation narrative has to do with the Jewish people bringing Jesus into the world and also helping to bring him back. Yeah. And, and I would say this is not a question, more of a comment that, God's faithfulness to physical Israel should give those of us who are spiritually Israel 100%. great confidence that he remains faithful to them, that he'll remain faithful to us as well. Exactly. I mean, what I say to Christians, they're like, well, you know, Israel messed up and God just moved on. I'm like, whoa, I hope that's not true, because <laughs> what confidence do you have as a Christian that like, you know, the new covenant you have, there won't be a newer covenant. And you, you just messed up one time too many. And God's like, you know what? plan C. We're moving on to someone else. And so it's so important. This says something about God. You know, uh, Second Timothy says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Uh, Genesis 15, when God makes a covenant with Abra Abraham, he he enters in twice. He, 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 he validates the covenant by himself, mm -hmm. saying, if you don't uphold the end of your covenant, I'm, I'm going to pay the penalty. And so we see that. It's, it's such, so important for us to to see that it, all everything that happens with Israel is not about Israel, it's not, not about favoritism. It's because is, God chose Israel for a purpose, and that was to reveal His nature to us, in spite of Israel's disobedience. Yeah, that's that's a good word, Michael. Thank you so much for for taking the time to be with us today and to have this conversation with us. Before I let you go, would you just please tell our our listeners where they can keep track of your ministry and and get updates from you and things things like that? 
Yeah, absolutely. We have a, a website, Firm Israel, F I R M Israel dot org. Find everything about the ministry. Um, we also have on social media, we're quite active Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Firm Israel. And uh, we've opened up an emergency crisis relief fund where 100% of those funds go to the families that are hurting from this crisis. And so if you know someone who's interested in that, you can share that. And the one other thing I'll say, uh, we, we really felt the need to pray, not just for Israel in general, but to pray for Israel by name. And just thinking about these 200 plus hostages that are in Gaza, it's be so easy to forget. So we actually published on our website the names of all the hostages. And we felt like God gave us a scripture, Isaiah 49, where Zion says, am I forsaken? Am I forgotten by God? Um, and, and God responds, he says, can a woman, can a nursing mother forget her child? Can she have not compassion on the son of her womb? Surely even she may forget, but I will not forget you. And then he says this, he says, I've engraved you on the palms of my hand. And so we're calling Christians around the world to this prayer challenge where we're writing the name of one of the hostages on our hands every day as a reminder that they're known by God. They're not forgotten. They're seen. And as a reminder to us to pray for them by name. So if you go to pray for Israel by name.com, uh, you can watch the video. We've already had tens of thousands of Christians around the world take this challenge. Churches, I've seen churches where every single name of every single captive is on or a hostage is on one of their hands. And uh, it's just a really practical thing we can do to remember these people are living at one of the darkest moments of their lives. And we want to remind them they're not forgotten, they're not forsaken. God, God has their names inscribed on his hand, and we're going to do that in turn. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been really a yeah. privilege. Well, well, Michael, actually, you know, we, we always, uh, you know, before we start recording always with the narrative, we always say a prayer, uh, but actually, David, would you mind close us out and pray? And what's the name? Is that Ronnie on your hand right yeah, now? Ronnie, 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 David, would you mind praying us out and praying for Ronnie? Father, we come before you um, as humbly and boldly as we know how, because you ask us to to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but we pray for the families that have lost folks to this war already, um, the hostages that have been taken uh, against their will. Lord, we pray for um, Roni right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you will watch over and protect uh, uh, all of the hostages, Lord, that um, that no weapon formed against uh, Roni will will prosper. No weapon formed against your holy city um, will prosper, Lord. That that they have the iron dome. We understand, but Lord, that your angels, your holy angels, would be dispatched over um, Israel to keep and to protect uh, those your people. Father, we also pray um, for the innocents in Palestine, those who are being used as human shields. Um, to a wicked um, terrorist organization. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you are, um, do what only you can do. We don't understand all the ins and outs, Lord, how you can love um, the, the most unlovable of us. Um, but Lord, we lean on you and trust you um, to, to, to meet every need, Lord, on both sides, according to your riches. Um, Lord, we thank you that you're doing it even now protecting and providing in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Michael. Thank you, guys. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Narrative, presented by CCV and produced by Wessler Media. If you found today's episode insightful, leave us a review or rating and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. We're your hosts, Mike Andrews, Aaron Bear, and David Mahan, and we'll see you next time on The Narrative.